everybody. Welcome to Midnight Radio. I'm your host, Jerry Adams. Today we're going to take a deep dive into the University of Idaho murders. We've been going over this all week. I have a lot more information that's coming out every day, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to go over exactly what happened. We're going to take it back to the beginning, go over what happened, then we're going to walk you through the evidence that has been released so far. Some of it's been released from the family of the murdered victims, and some of it's been released by the police department. So, for those of you that don't know, there was a murder that happened in the University of Idaho in Moscow, Idaho. There were four students, and they lived off campus in a private home, a private house they were all renting. And about... Between 3 a.m. and 4, they were murdered violently as they were in their beds, asleep. That's where we're at. This happened on November 13th. Again, this is a horrible tragedy. We're all in shock. This... We can't help but think about what happened in Florida in the 70s with Ted Bundy. We don't know if it's a serial killer. We're just going to go into all the politics between the family and the police, the the, the investigation, the detectives. We're going to go into all of that, and maybe that will help you understand What's going on here? This didn't happen long ago. It was the 13th. We're on the 20th now. The investigation is still underway. Let me go ahead and uh, we'll start with here they are right here. There was four individuals that were murdered in the house. One was male and the other three were female. And there was two roommates that were not murdered. So when you're looking here, you're you're looking at the three females that were murdered, the two that weren't. One of the females' boyfriend was there, and he was murdered also. We're going to tell you all their names here in a minute. There's the boyfriend that was murdered right here. We're going to go into the weapon. It was used. We're going to go over what the forensics told us. We're going to go into the maps of where they went that night. We're going to go into everything. But first, we're going to play this from the police department. This is the Homicide Investigation Unit, and this is a press release they put out on the day. And also, after we talk about the Idaho murders, I have one more thing I want to tell you about. And this is pressing. This is about a, a serial killer. Whose, whose daughter turned him in, he's dead. But she turned him in after he died. And maybe one of the victims, well, maybe you know one of the victims. And now you know where they are and what happened to him. We'll go over that at the end. My name is Chief James Fry with the Moscow Police Department. I'm going to be reading from my notes today because I want the information you receive to be extremely accurate. We know you have questions, and so do we. That is why we're here. I'd like to thank everyone for attending this press conference. Joining me today is the Latak County Prosecutor Bill Thompson, University of Idaho President Scott Green, Provost and Vice President Tori Lawrence, University of Idaho Dean of Students Blaine Eccles, Latak County Sheriff Richie Skiles, Chief Deputy of Latak County Tim Best, Idaho State Police Colonel Kedrick Wills. The Moscow Police Department would like to extend our condolences to all family members, friends, the University of Idaho, and the Moscow community. 
This was a horrible crime that took the lives of Ethan Chapman, Zanna Kernodal, Madison Mogan, and Clay, Kaylee Goncalves. This horrible crime has affected all of us, the families, the University of Idaho, our community, our country, and our officers. Agencies that are involved in this task force include Lake Dye County Sheriff's Office, the Idaho State Police, and the Federal Bureau of Investigations. As we continue our investigation, we have learned that Ethan and Zana were at a party on campus, and Madison and Kaylee were at a downtown bar. They arrived home sometime after 145. If anyone in our community or across our nation has any information about these times or the victim's whereabouts, please call our tip line at 208-883-7180. The facts of the case that we know right now. We know that these homicides occurred in the early morning hours of Sunday, November 13th. Around noon, Moscow officers received a call of an unconscious person. Officers discovered the bodies of Ethan Chapman, Zana Kernodal, Madison Mogan, and Kaylee Goncavs inside the residence on King Road. The four were stabbed with a knife, but no weapon has been located at this time. There was no sign of forced entry into the residence. Investigators are continuing to collect evidence at the scene. Investigators are working to develop a timeline to relevant events. Autopsies are taking place today on all the victims so we can continue to gather evidence and solve the crime. Investigators are working to follow up on all leads and to identify a person of interest. Based on details of the scene, we believe this was an isolated, targeted attack on our victims. We do not have a suspect at this time, and that individual is still out there. We cannot say that there's no threat to the community. And as we have stated, please stay vigilant, report any suspicious activity, and be aware of your surroundings at all times. What we do know, or what we don't know, excuse me, the identity and location of the suspect, the location of the knife or any clothing that was worn by the suspect. Currently, we have 25 plus investigators working this case, as well as assistance from the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the Idaho State Police. We're reviewing video that has been collected, but we are asking citizens to contact us with any information you may have that will help in this investigation. Once again, we're asking anyone with a to call the tip line at 208-883-7180. At this time, I would like to introduce the University of Idaho President, Scott Green. I'm going to stop right there because we got all we need to know so far. So that's where they're, they were at. And let me see. See if I can get a date on this. They know the homicides occurred in the early morning. They knew that they were all stabbed with a knife. And they know what kind of knife now that came from the autopsy. It was a K bar knife that identified it as a K bar. And they, they also said that whoever did this, it was a crime of passion because of the amount of stab wounds in each individual. It went way beyond the normal murder. And anybody being killed by a knife, it's very personal. It's very up close. It's also very quiet. So there's two roommates who are in there. There were two female roommates. And as you can see, they weren't involved in it. They didn't even know what was happening. They didn't, the bodies weren't discovered till noon the next day when nobody showed up for any place they were supposed to be. Now, there's two two of the roommates that worked. Write this. Let me get this here. Where they work at? They worked at a restaurant together. See, it was called the Mad Greek, I believe. Uh, 
This is interesting to me because it's been reported that Kylie Goncalves, or Goncalves, I've heard it pronounced either way, you'll see in a minute, but I think it's Goncalves. I think Kylie Goncalves reported several months ago to having a stalker, but nothing ever came of it. They worked at a place called The Mad Greek, yes. So I'm wondering if maybe, and I hope they are questioning the other people that work there with him at The Mad Greek. I'm thinking maybe there's a connection with somebody at the school. It's somebody at the Mad Greek. They know him from both places. So let's keep that in our thoughts. And we don't know anything more than that. And they worked at the Mad Greek on that part of it. So what else do we know? Well, there was a food truck. I'll play that for you here, too. Uh, There's a Twitch video where they were at the food truck. Now, Madison Mogan and Kylie Gonclaves were best friends, very best friends. They're the ones that worked at the Mad Greek together. And they're at this food truck. So there was some questions about this food truck right here. There's a guy here that was next to them, and you'll see the guy right... In the bottom picture right there. Who has a hat on? Oh, you'll see, first of all, the ladies are in the top video on the upper right. That's where they're at. You see one staggering across, hugging some man. And you can see that she looks inebriated. Not that that matters or not, but she she can't stand still. She seems inebriated. Okay, now, now they're standing in front of the food truck. Right there. I'm trying to see if I can see the guy that they were talking about. Nevertheless, I'm going to pause it right here. It doesn't matter because... That guy was cleared. So the food truck guy that was there with them, who they didn't know at first, they tracked him down. And uh, he's been cleared. So, th- But this video of the food truck, and it was on Twitch, this enabled them to be able to come out with the time of the murder. So this account for this food truck, the stream starts at 10 p.m. on Saturday nights. And since the girl appeared three hours and 43 minutes in, that would place him at this truck around 1.45 a.m. So we're starting to get a timeline here. And uh, I got a video from the Idaho mayor. Let's go ahead and play that. There was no burglary. There was no robbery. Uh, There was no hostage taking. There was no nothing. Just... Uh, a crime and gone. Is that the police told you? Uh, well, yeah, there is no burglary apparent. Everything was where it was, so. This is them at the house. And that's it. It's a picture of the house where the murders took place right here. Now, we're going to talk about the doors here in a minute because her sister said something very interesting, which, I mean, we're about to hear from her sister right now, or her friend, I believe. But that door, that door, we're going to learn more about that right now. And this just came out within the last couple days. Apparently, the door was never locked. 
So not since the Amanda Knox case, when the American student and her boyfriend were accused of stabbing her roommate, has a brutal college killing gripped the attention of the nation in the way that this story has. And it has raised so many questions about who did this, how did they do it, why did they do it. The Moscow, Idaho killer who slaughtered these four students in the prime of their lives is out there somewhere at this hour. And now people are starting to speak out. Jeffrey Canodal says his daughter, Zana's autopsy, shows that she tried to fight off her killer. The sister of Kaylee Gonsalves warns you of Idaho students to get out now, saying, quote, you are not safe until this sicko is found. Two University of Idaho students who knew some of these victims join me now, Madison Fitzgerald and Tanner McLean. Madison and Tanner, I know you're both in uh, university leadership, and we thank both of you for being with us today. I know this is just a, an unimaginably hard time for all of you as you head off to Thanksgiving. Um, Madison, tell me a little bit about your relationship to some of these individuals, and, and when's the last time that you were in that house? Um, I don't recall the last time I was in that house. Um, I was very close with Zana and Ethan. Um, it was Zana's home, and she was just the most welcoming and kind person that I'd ever known. Um, a lot of people came in and out of that house just because of how kind all four of them were um, and welcoming to have visitors and guests over all the time. Um, Ethan and Zana, uh, it was a pleasure to know them, and uh, this is something that has truly rocked our community. Let me ask you this, Madison, from being in the house, you know, how I understand that there were several bedrooms on three different floors. Was Zana's bedroom on the same level as the other two women's bedroom? How close together were they? Um, I believe that Zana's bedroom was on a different floor than the other two bedrooms. And, and what about the other two roommates? And I believe we have pictures of the other two roommates who uh, thankfully survived this um, and are cooperating were understood. Where, where was their bedroom? Um, I'm not sure where their bedrooms were located. Can, can you explain how, you know... You know, I don't think she is a very close very close with the people that were murdered i think maybe she was there once maybe she wasn't i mean that's neither here nor there but i'm just i'm getting that feeling what do you think let me know if you'd like to call in with a comment or question about what we're going over today you can do that the phone number is 325-261-0892 that is 325-261-0892 uh leave me a comment or question up to three minutes how you would enter the house when you went there? Did you go through this sliding no, door part. that we're hearing about, or did you have to use a code to enter the house to visit uh, Zana or Zana and Ethan? Um, there were two points of entry to the house. Um, most frequently, people used the door that was located on the basement, and then you took a set of stairs to get to the main floor. And, and was it your experience that you would um, that you knew the code, or that people knew the code, or was it you know did you have to use the code to enter the house? Um, when I would go there, the the, the code wouldn't be activated, so uh, we could just open the door and get in. So that's some new information about the code not being activated, and that leads people to think that maybe the code wasn't activated. And I've heard it reported that the code wasn't activated most of the time, so a lot of people entered and left. But these, this is a modern locked door. This isn't the old kind of door, so it makes me think that maybe the media aren't understanding. With these new locked doors, you unlock them with your cell phone. So as you're walking up, you can unlock it. So... Maybe that's a part of it that they're not understanding. Um, right now I'm researching the Golden State Killer. I'm doing some research on that, and I found that one of the typical things that he did is he would pre-stock a place out. I mean, Golden State Killer is horrible. And a lot of the women that he, the families, I should say, that he attacked had sliding glass doors, and he would make sure that he was able to, he would disable that weeks before or the day before, he would go in there. So is that a possibility here? They did have a sliding door. Maybe this is a serial killer. Maybe this was a stalker. Maybe this is is somebody who took that door and disabled it. Maybe it had nothing to do with the code, or maybe the code that was there, but they didn't know that because they weren't close. They were just stalking one of the ladies. 
that's something to think about. Also, yesterday, or the day before yesterday, they were gathering forensic evidence on the door and getting possible, I heard, possible shoe prints. So, let's continue this. Okay. Um, Tanner, you're the student body president. Uh, I'm sure that, you know, that's important leadership at this moment. Uh, what was your relationship to these individuals, and what can you tell us about them? Yes, I knew Zana, and uh, all four of them truly touched countless students on campus, the lives of countless students. They, they reach, you know, social butterflies would always be, um, saying hi to them out around campus or um, off campus, and uh, you know the impact has been felt across the entire Vandal community. Um, it's been it's been extremely difficult since their loss, and uh, they just they were close with everyone I knew and all my friends, and which is why uh, this past week um, students have been leaving. Um, I left myself because of just how difficult it's been in Moscow emotionally um, right now. So the, um, the two other individuals who lived in the house, the other two uh, women, Bethany and Dylan, did either of you know Bethany or Dylan? Do you know them? Um, I didn't know them personally, but I, I heard that they were um, of the same light, kind, um, genuine individuals. Uh, Tanner, have you ever heard about a, a stalker on campus or anything to that effect? There were reports that there was someone that uh, some people were concerned about back in September. Back in September, there was a vandal alert sent out to students. Um, someone on a, um, a, just a sidewalk did make um, a vandal alert. I heard this report, and it was reported that there was a knife threat on campus. This was in September. The police ruled it out and said it was not related at all, and they knew who that was. Um, some sort of threat, but I can't speak to, to that. Um, that's, that's more of a question for the, the Moscow authorities. So, Tanner, you know, what are you all thinking about what happened here? Obviously, nobody, nobody knows for sure. You know, but do you feel like this is an outsider or that this is somebody that they likely knew? I really don't want to speculate on this. Um, you know, right now, students want answers, mm -hmm. and uh, all of us are, are very heartbroken, scared, and emotional during this time. But uh, I can't speculate as to what happened. Uh, all that we can do as a student body is hope and pray that the authorities make. Um, There's really no way of knowing right now. No way of knowing at all. Let's see what else we have here. We heard from the mayor. One of the University of Ohio students put on a message on her Instagram right before she died, about an hour or so before she died. She had a picture of her and her friends talking about how lucky she was. And this was the actual picture she posted. She was saying how lucky she was. I'm one lucky girl to have friends like these on her Instagram. One lucky girl to be surrounded by these people every day. It was right before her death. Very, very heartbreaking. And the fact that now there's a social media presence, it makes, makes the murders more personal, more personable. It's more easy for us to... Imagine this being our daughters. It's easier for us to imagine this being our sisters and our friends than ever before. Now, there's no idea who did this. They really, they really have no idea. Let me see. We do have more information about this. The police originally said that this was an isolated incident. They didn't know who it was. They somehow could tell that whoever committed this murder knew the people and that this was a personal murder. Well, because of the way they were murdered, the brutality and the fact that it was a knife, that's one way the police normally lean thinking, well, to kill somebody with a knife is very personal. You have to really want them dead. And you want to personally deliver that death by your hand. 
So that's why they said that. First of all, they said nobody should be worried. The sister of Kylie freaked out about them saying that, and they said you should be very worried. You should be very worried because they don't know who it is. They have no suspect. If they don't have the suspect arrested, why should you not be worried? You should be very worried. Play these for you. Let me see. This is her sister right here. She's saying a lot of people had access to the code to the front door because the girls were so sociable and real revealed that the girls had collectively called Jack 10 times before the massacre. We're about to go into Jack. About to talk about Jack right now. Let me see. Now, one of them was 21-year-old Kaylee Gonzalez, a senior preparing to graduate just next month. Her sister Olivia joins us now. I'm very sorry uh, to meet you this way. What do you want people to know about your sister? Yeah, I think the most important thing to know about Kaylee is she was a go-getter and she was an absolute fighter. Um, and I want people to take this personally because she was everyone's daughter. You know, she's she's the neighbor. She's the friend. Um, you know, she was the girl who made your coffee in the morning. Um, and everyone should be taking this personally. So we're taking it personally. And it doesn't make any sense. Certainly not to you. Um, in terms of what you understood about your sister's life, was there any threat that she had ever had? Was there anybody who was coming after her on social media? Did she have a past, a problem with a boyfriend or a friend? Anything to inform why somebody would do something so violent to her, her friend, her other roommate, and her boyfriend? Absolutely. There's nothing. There's no boy problem. There's no threat. There's no um, high-risk lifestyle that could have indicated this. Um, it has taken all of us completely by shock, and we have absolutely no ideas, none. Now, your frustration, other than just dealing with the tremendous loss for your family, uh, is what in terms of the investigation? I think this happened in a small town, and I absolutely understand that uh, local authorities were probably overwhelmed, and I don't blame them at all. They did exactly what they should have done. Um, but we're losing critical time, and I want... Now, she's about to make some statements here, and here's my question to you. I want you to think about this before she says what she's about to say. I, I realize that, you know, the longer it takes an investigation to find the perpetrator, especially after 48 hours, you would think if it's somebody that personally knew these ladies that were murdered and the boy and the man, then uh, they'd be able to find him, right? If There would be some you know, some link that would be able to show you who did it right away. So once you go beyond that 48 hours, it gives whoever committed this murder a lot of time to leave and hide evidence, uh, destroy, completely destroy evidence. So you got, you have to think about that. Um, they think, they think the murder was between 18, 20, 18, 22 years old. So this would have, um, I recently read a, a profiler's report on this. And if it was somebody at that, that age, they would be an unsophisticated criminal, right? Uh, which would show that they usually do crimes of passion like this. You know, they tend to have a crime of passion instead of it being well thought out. Therefore, the weapon and the clothing that were used wouldn't have been gotten rid of sophisticatedly. And I'm not going to tell you the different levels of sophistication because I might be training somebody. I'm not going to do that. But there's different levels of that. So we're about to go into, she's about to go into some phone calls made. And these are things that weren't told by the police. Is it okay for her to do this? Is she 
somehow impeding the police. Maybe they were looking at the suspect that she's about to mention or that she mentions, but they didn't want them to know. Is she hurting this case or is she actually, and I, I don't, I don't have an answer to this. Maybe collectively we can come up with one. That's what I'm asking you. So I understand she's putting pressure on the police. I noticed one of her, one of her major things right away was them saying that it was safe. Don't worry about it. And she's saying everybody should worry about it. And the police came back and said, uh, you know, she's right. You know, everybody should be on the alert and worry about it. And she's telling everybody, Hey students, you need to leave that. You leave that university until, until they catch that killer. Which, I mean, come on. So that is also putting pressure on the police, and that's what she's been doing like no other person I've ever seen. I'm not saying she's wrong for that. I'm asking, though, do you think she's impeding the investigation by doing this? Or is she helping it continue? Okay, let's continue here more coverage. I want more done. I understand that we can't release information. It's an ongoing investigation. I don't ask for that. I don't want to impede on anything, but I want more people speaking out. And if that takes the police to push that agenda, that's fine. Um, But unfortunately, I feel like it's been me and the families pushing that agenda. And that's been really difficult. You found the video of your sister and her roommate at the food truck? I was tipped off to that video um, on Sunday. And when you gave it to the police, you didn't like how they handled it. That's that's the boy right there. You can see. I won't necessarily say that. I will say I think that they're probably processing a lot of information. um, And they, you know, basically just said, thank you. Uh, You know, but I never really heard any follow up on that. Um, I did wind up getting in contact with someone a few days after Sunday And I was able to provide more of a timeline that I had created. Um, And and it did seem like they needed more video of that food truck. So I provided that then as well. So that was a little frustrating. But again, there's so many agencies involved here. I can't say I necessarily blame them. You were curious about one of the men that you saw in the video and you tracked him down? Yeah, I think a lot of people were curious about that person. Um, We were able to identify him. And as far as I know, he has cooperated with the police. um, And that's all that I know about that. There are two obvious uh, concerns about what happened here. The first one is there were other people in the house. And there's only really one scenario I can think of, which is that people were asleep when they were attacked that would have made it anything that could be close to quiet what Mm -hmm. does it mean to you that two other people were in the house do you know that was really early Um, you know have you spoken i mean late early in the morning late yeah um i i do know who they were i have not spoken to them um they were my sister's roommates obviously i know who she lived with um but i'm i'm thankful that we didn't lose more lives here and i'm thankful that hopefully there is good information to be found there with police officers and and with you know, interviews um, that will give us a good leg up. And I'm hoping that that news breaks soon because we still just don't have that. The authorities, uh, the police today had a press conference that you didn't know about. That that happens sometimes, especially when you have a small police force that's a little overwhelmed. Um, They said there could have been multiple assailants. I don't know how there couldn't have been unless everybody was dead asleep. I don't know how one person um, stabs that many people and kills all of them um, without there being a struggle and, you know, and lots of, but we don't know much about the scene. I do know this, Olivia, um, you're processing there a lot was a right lot of now struggle. and you're really clear headed and really focused. And I'm sure people who care about you are telling you, you're going to have a long road here in terms of dealing with this. And we are here for all of it. Uh, we will follow this story to its conclusion. We're all, All right, so let's see what else we have here. There was a report. That Kylie Calvez and her friend had called somebody right before. Let me pull this up so I'm very, very exact on this.
Well, I got something breaking from an hour ago. Kylie and her best friend both called somebody named Jack right before the murder, about an hour before the murder. Kylie called How many times did she call? Six times. And her best friend called twice. So let's talk about what that implies. What do we know about that? We know about the phone call. We know the name was Jack. I found an update as of an hour ago. We're going to go over it right now. Of who Jack might be. So this is important to know that when there's phone calls made, well, if they, they can track down who this Jack guy is, and they can't easily by the phone number. They're going to be able to track his whereabouts by the phone. And, uh, you know, they can ping it, see what tower been ping, it was pinging off of, and when. Now it's going to take time to do that, right? It hasn't been that, that long now. Also, it's going to take them time to process the evidence from that house. It's not like it is in the movies that's the problem it's not like it is in the movies it takes time to match fingerprints it it takes time to uh, sequence dna so know that it takes time to contact the phone companies and get through and deal with all the red tape and the warrants and everything to get the things done they need to get done but if they they have the phone number they know who this jack is i'm going to tell you right now who jack could possibly be and we're gonna we're about to talk about that right now. So they can track Jack's phone and they can know where Jack was. They can know why Jack didn't answer. They can see if Jack was moving around. Jack got the call he did that he did not answer because they did not release the information whether he answered or not. We assume he did not. And they can see if at that point his phone was moving and then it wasn't. Perhaps he left left his cell phone there, murdered somebody then came back, and then his phone was moving again. Perhaps, and they can see, because these aren't regular phones now. They can also see his web history on the phone. And they can see the next day if he was checking things to see if anybody found the bodies, if he did it. I mean, they can check these things. It takes a little bit of time. It takes some forensic teams to do this stuff. But let's go over what we know about Jack. And I'm not saying that this was the Jack they messaged because obviously we don't know that. But there is a fact that, hey, we found a Jack that's related to these two ladies. So let's look at Jack, shall we? Who is Jack DeCour? Kaylee Gonclaves called her ex-boyfriend several times on night she was killed. There's a picture of Jack on the left. Among the University of Idaho host students murdered, two of them had reportedly called Jack multiple times before tragedy struck. The bodies of Kaylee Gonclaves, 21, and Madison Mogan, 21, Ethan Chapin, 20, and his girlfriend, Exana. Kernodal, 20, were found on Sunday, November 13th inside off-campus apartment in Moscow, Idaho. It has now come to light that Jack is Gonclaves' ex-boyfriend, Jack DeClure. Gonclaves' sister, Goncalves' sister, reportedly said on Friday, November 18th, that her sister made six calls. Okay, I stand corrected. Six calls to a friend named Jack between 226 and 244. Mogan called him three times before Gon Calves tried once more, so they all wanted to get a hold of him. Why? Who is Jack DeClure? Gon Calves reportedly uploaded a few pictures with her ex-boyfriend DeClure on Instagram, whom she dated in 2019. He was the same person she called before the murder. She'd upload a number of pictures with DeClure 
while she was studying. So apparently she was also part of the Beta Theta Pi sorority. According to the Post, it looks like DeClure had asked Goncalves to prom in 2019 as she uploaded a picture with him on her timeline and captioned it, Prom. There's her prom pictures and there's Jack. The police and the coroner revealed on Friday, November 18th, that the victims were stabbed multiple times while they were asleep. There was no sexual assault reported. The two roommates, who were also asleep at the same time with them, escaped unscathed. The identity of the person who called 911 at the time of the incident has not been revealed. As previously reported, officials believe the attack was deliberate, but they are yet to find a motive. They believe the attack happened somewhere between 3 a.m. and 4 a.m. All right, so... That's a new update. We have Jack right here. Jack. That was her ex-boyfriend. Now, we don't know why she was calling him. We don't know if she called him before. This is evidence we just don't have. We just don't have it. Um, We also don't have toxicology reports from the body. They were obviously impaired. Maybe they take a hair sample and they find out that Jack, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying this is true, but I'm just saying, let's say they take a hair sample and they see um, these girls smoke marijuana. Let's say Jack sells marijuana and maybe that's all the phone call was about. They were freaking out and they wanted some marijuana. He didn't have anything to do with it. We don't know this. We don't know this. It's bad to jump to conclusions. But it's important to keep your mind open to possibilities, right? You always have to keep your mind open to Paul to uh, possibilities of the worst things happen to protect yourself. People always keep your doors locked. This little community I live in, there's especially if you live out in the country, there's reports of murders, not murders, but people breaking into houses and. The wife waking up and seeing a man over the bed. So these are things to think about. Let's see, what else? Have we gone over everything that we have? We got some breaking news nobody has yet. It's going to take a while for them to process all the information they have. And I don't usually, this police department has been letting a lot of information come out. But the sister more so. So the pressure, is that is that good? Is that going to keep the pressure on? Is it not? I'm not. I'm not sure where to go with this. Um, I don't know. My opinion is, is um, we're going to look at this as an example and see if the pressure helped things happen. I know. She she was talking about calling the police, giving them information about the food truck and them saying thank you, and that's it. Well, they're not allowed to talk about these things at all, and there's legal reasons for this. They can't do it. It, it damages their case against the, the individuals, and it lets information out that might tip off the suspect, even though they say they have no suspects now. But even usually, except in murder cases like this, but... You report something, they take the information, if they catch the person or not, they don't even come back and tell you. You know, you won't even know unless you check back up on it. So, there's this other story I wanted to go over with you real quick in closing. Did I go over everything I said I was going to go over? If I didn't, let me know. Email me, midnightrad.io101 at gmail.com or Give me a quick message on the voicemail line. That's 325-261-0892. I'm going to continue to follow this. I do this daily. We're streaming live right now on midnightrad.io for the the rest of this week. It's going to be, we we'll start at 5 a.m. And next week too, then we're going to pop over to 5 p.m. We're going to let you know about the timing. 
The uh, schedule is going to be on the website, midnightrad.io. And I'm going to put out these special videos whenever I have one, probably about once a week. I don't know, but we'll see. I got another mind-blowing tragic story coming up next. Mind-blowing. Haven't heard of anything like this, but I suspect that there is a lot more that's going to happen. Look at this with me. Exclusive. This is from, who was it from? Newsweek. Alleged serial killer's daughter explains why she told her story. Now from one of the first to report this story, Navid Jamali is a Newsweek editor-at-large and author of How to Catch a Russian Spy. He was one of the reporters exclusively on site when cadaver dogs searched the area where Lucy Studi says her father buried bodies. Navita, how did you come across the story and decide that this person, Lucy, uh, Lucy Studi, the daughter who's alleging her father was a serial killer, is credible? Yeah, Anderson, it's a great question. Um, this started off, as many of these stories do, it was a tip. And it went to my colleague, Eric Firkinoff, who then asked me to sort of fact check it. And look, Anderson, as it is with these stories, it comes down to one person. And really, it came down to a conversation where I sat down with Lucy in person. And, you know, I find her story, frankly, credible. Why hasn't anyone really investigated what Lucy has said in in the past? So Lucy, one of the things that makes Lucy so credible, Anderson, is that for 45 years, she has been telling the same story consistently. And we found this in evidence in some of the early records that we've obtained. And it's something that the sheriff who is leading this investigation has told us as well. So why it hasn't happened is really, I think. The name of the serial killer was Donald Study. He was a, he was a. He was a mechanic. He was a diesel mechanic. He ran a ruck, uh, truck, what do you call it? A truck wrecker service and a wrecker service. And throughout his career, his daughter says that he would find people who were vulnerable. Runaways, women with broke down vehicles that were by themselves. He would take these people, bring them to the house torture them, and then murder them. And she said that that he would have her help as a little girl. She said she first witnessed this when she was five years old, when she was a five-year-old girl. And one thing her father did is she, I believe she said since she was 12, she would tell people about this. She would tell teachers. She would tell a church official, she told a policeman one time, but her father would say, because I would say, you know what, your daughter is saying this. She's like, oh, her, oh, she has an active imagination. I'm sorry. Oh, this is so embarrassing. Things like that. That's what he would do. And he did it her whole life till they all thought that she was crazy. So nobody believed a word she said. She kept saying it and kept saying it and kept saying it. She says there's about 15 missing people. Actually, no, that's how many people have reached out to her. So she put a post on Facebook. They have a closed group on Facebook. And on that, she posted the details of some of the women that she remembered. She had 15 people, as of the time of this writing, 50 people that had contacted her and like, say, hey, I'm missing somebody. I'm missing in my family, and they're in that area. Do you have any idea? So she told investigators that she remembers as much as 50 to 70 people, mostly women, and they're buried around the property. She tried to get them excavating it for years, and they never did. They're currently in the process of excavating it now. We haven't heard if there's any bodies yet. This guy. And how many serial killers don't get caught? He died and never got caught. Oh, I'm sure he's paying the price now after he died. She alleges that her father, Donald Dean Study, would bring most of his victims home to their trailer from nearby Omaha. Lucy Study, Study said that her father would typically beat or bash the woman's head, 
bearing most in a deep well on properties in the area as well as in shallow graves among the more mushroom trails on the land. She said that at least two of the men are also buried in the land. I'll show you pictures of the land. How about that? Oh, this is a member of the sheriff's department. He's putting a he's putting a thing there to signal the cadaver dogs what tree to sniff under. Uh, he's known as a drunk and a violent man, and he bet is he died of heart failure at seventy five in twenty thirteen. Now, since this story was originally reported, they've had a lot of cases of people going there, going to the gates. Now, police have locked the gates a few weeks ago and have tried to stop the traffic from going to the hard-to-find sites where at least three cadaver dogs have signaled the presence of human remains. So there is a signal that there is human remains, and I don't know a cadaver dog that's been wrong yet. If I'm wrong about that, you let me know. So there's a Facebook group, um, invitation only, which I think just about all of them are though. They're dedicated to, uh, the case and supporting her. She's got a lot of voicemails. She's got a lot of message. And, uh, she said she's having a hard time with all the messages she's getting right now. She described a profile of the women. She says she remembers her father luring to their trailer, missing women from 1970 from 1982, especially around 76 and 80, adding that most were from Omaha, Council Bluffs, Platt Smith, Nebraska City, surrounding areas, including towns along the Iowa-Nebraska border and north or south of that stretch. You know, I'm thinking... I'm thinking that... uh, if you just had a family member disappear, it's probably from a serial killer. They, they, I hate to say it. Referring to her father, she wrote, he was a gas station attendant, mechanic, tow truck driver, and many gas stations and truck stops. She, did, she described a truck stop in Council Bluffs, Iowa, that had a Greyhound bus stop saying he would prey on down-and-out women with no place to stay the night or to live. He picked up truck stop prostitutes he picked up lonely drunk women at bars people who wouldn't be missed he remember the she remembers the victims being female late 20s early 30s average height average medium build no skinny underweight women no women with a few extra pounds he liked dark hair uh black hair these are some of the hair she remembers black hair dark brown hair Dark brown with red highlights hair, dirty blonde hair, no all blondes, shoulder length, give or take a few inches, some curl in their hair, plain dressers, not a lot of makeup or jewelry. In the plea to family, she wrote, if the missing person fits the description above, send me a picture with their name or missing person bulletin only. I'll look at it. If I can definitely remember the face, I'll let authorities know. Now, she told Newsweek that she would like everybody to wait until after they find bodies and then let the authorities work on identifications. It's too early to identify victims. Here's a picture of the guy right here. He's got those cold, dead eyes, doesn't he? I think he does. Now, an excavation, they said, could happen as early as next month, which, I mean, next month in Omaha, really, is it going to happen in December? I'm not thinking it's going to happen until until spring, maybe late spring. That's just me, though. I mean, what do I know? She said that uh, he did many things to keep her from talking. 
one thing he would do is threaten her, say, I will kill you just like I kill them. He would choke her. He would hit her. She recalls this one time while she was still in grade school that he nearly killed her by choking her. He lifted her up from the ground. He choked her so hard. She said living with him was horrible. She was constantly on high alert. If something made him mad, he would take it out on the kids. The name of the town is Green Hollow. She said that whenever something would happen at her house, she would tell herself to remember, to remember, to remember. And when the things were happening, when he was murdering these women and helping her, having her help him dispose of the bodies, she would take her, her fingernails and dig it into her arms and tell herself to remember so she would re- remember what happened. In addition to her brother who died at 39 and two sisters, her father had six more children through girlfriends or marriage. One of the women interviewed by Newsweek said that Donald tried to run her over when they were dating his late teens. The woman who was pregnant with his son said she was saved by a neighbor, but later in life the woman said he would stalk her as she cleaned houses and one time stopped her in a car with the son and threatened to shoot her. I could have been the first one in all this mess, the woman told Newsweek. Many of the women in Donald Study's life died under questionable circumstances, including two allegedly by suicide, Lucy Study's mother and her stepmother. She put, if my two sisters are reading this, Lucy said, I want you to remember from 1988 down to your earliest memories about us. Was dad's lies about me true? Do you remember any incidents? No, you don't. You repeat these things about me only because our dad repeated them over and over to us and everyone else our entire childhood. I'd like to thank you for tuning in. Please subscribe if you like this information you're getting. Please subscribe. I do it every day. Midnightrad.io. You can check out the podcast. If you're watching this on YouTube, go to my About page. I have the podcast on every podcasting app. It's, It's absolutely free. I do it daily. And that's where I update all this information that I'm giving you now in the previous weeks. I keep up with it. I update it as I get new information. I appreciate it. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Until next time, I give you all my best. So before this video got out to broadcast, I got an update. So I just wanted to break in here and give it to you. There was a press conference by the by the police department. And not only that, but also the mother of uh, Kylie Gonclaves had something to say. Not the sister, but the mother. The sister is the one that told us about, about the boyfriend that both of the girls called right before the murder. But the the mother said that they love him. He had nothing to do with it. He's torn up about what happened to his girlfriend. She even went in to say that they were probably going to get married and have children, which I, I find kind of funny because they weren't. That was her ex-boyfriend, not her current boyfriend. But whatever the case, that's what the mother said, not what the sister said. The sister is the one that released his name. Nevertheless, in this press conference from the police department of Moscow, Idaho, they took a few questions, but they also said that they also told 
who they have cleared. So I found that very interesting. For example, they said, we do not believe the following individuals are involved in this crime. The two surviving roommates, a male seen in the grub truck food vendor, the video we went over, uh, specifically the one wearing a white hoodie, and a private party who provided rides home to Kaylee and Madison in the early morning hours of November 13th. Now, I, didn't, we didn't, I don't remember if we talked about that or not, but that is being reported as being an Uber driver. He added that the identity of the 911 caller and the 911 call have not been released. Uh, when it is released, I'll play it here. Additionally, they said that Mogan and Gon Calvez made multiple phone calls to a male subject just before they were murdered, but said they have reviewed and cleared those phone calls. They said that they are, have a lot of evidence they're going over. They realize that people want them to, to go faster in the investigation, quite frankly, and they said that they have to do a thorough, lawful investigation, and they owe it to the victims. That was what they said. Now, they said that they have not ruled out the possibility of multiple suspects who may be known to the victims. But they said they are sticking by their Tuesday statement, which they already went against. But they, they said again they're sticking by their Tuesday statement, describing the murders as an isolated, targeted attack. So it's a confusing message. They said people should be worried because they haven't caught the person, but this was definitely an isolated target attack. They said they believe it was a targeted attack because of the totality of circumstances that they're looking at. This is from the police chief, James Fry. He's not able to say if one person was being targeted. Of course, the four victims were close friends, all part of Greek life on campus. Uh, Kaylee, and Mogan, or uh, Gon, Gon Calvez and Mogan worked for the Mad Greek. They were all in a fraternity. They were all sorority sisters. And that is where we're at right now. I will continue to give you updates. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Website is midnightrad.io. You can catch me every day at 5 a.m. on midnightrad.io. I do a live broadcast there. Uh, please subscribe. If you like this kind of content, please subscribe. If you like our videos, please hit that like button. Thank you very much. I'll see you tomorrow. So before this video got out to broadcast, I got an update. So I just wanted to break in here and give it to you. There was a press conference 